Uh, this is the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, we're continuing our work on the three quarter budget for fiscal 21. And today we're going to be taking testimony from uh, the Department of Health. I can see that we have Dr. Levine, we have uh, Paul Daly with us again, and Sarah Clark from the agency. Uh, apologize for uh, starting a little later. We wanted to get uh, uh, we had to have several more members uh, get signed in before we wanted to start the testimony. Um, so um, I don't know if we have, you have um, uh, documents that you wanna put on the screen to share. Uh, we also had um, Chrissy um, send um, some questions to Dr. Levine. I think uh, at least uh, one of them was a follow-up to the question that got raised to Paul when he came and presented to joint fiscal um, on the uh, charge for certain tests that um, uh, I believe Senator Sears constituents uh, experienced. And so there was a desire to um, get a little bit more information and explanation about, um, about that situation. And, um, and there was a second one, I, but I can't remember off the top of my head. So um, it, we're going to probably be asking questions as well as we go along. But uh, with that, uh, Dr. Levine, you had probably a presentation um, that perhaps we would screen share. Is that your plan? Or did you just want to yeah. give us a verbal? It's quite brief, but we can do both. OK, that would be great. And most of what I'll say is really on the first page of this two page document. So basically, uh, may I begin? Yes, certainly. We have the document up in front of us. Home right, visiting so is first. Exactly. So you'll see that there's a state funding reduction of $1.1 million. Um, and most of this reduction, 850,000 to be exact, results from the delayed implementation of the expanded home visiting program. The purpose here is that we had originally envisioned the expansion would begin in July and the fiscal year 21 cost would be a million dollars in state funds. However, since we've been fully mobilized for the pandemic response since February, the planning on this project had to stop at that time. We now believe we'll be unable to begin the expanded program before the fourth quarter of fiscal year 21. So the restated budget just acknowledges this reality. It reduces our global commitment budget and our public health appropriation by a 1.8 million, and then the balance of the savings will come from slightly lower internal service charges and a revised estimate of the federal share of department administration costs. Oh, so so we, as you know, we have three appropriations. So this mainly impacts the public health appropriation, very slightly the administration and not at all the ADAP. All right. Um, any questions about this? So this is just um, in, in order to do the planning and advance work for implementation, just all the resources went to deal with the pandemic and as a result, a delay in getting this program ready um, to come online is, um, is being delayed um, until the last quarter. Correct, it's, it's still a very that, near and dear to our heart program. Uh, May I ask you a question about home visiting because this is an expansion. Well, we already have some home visiting uh, capacity in place. In light of the pandemic, um, what is the status of those home visits? Are they still being conducted? Um, I know that the same number of lives, I'll call it, would be covered. Um, the real question is, are they doing in-person right, right. visits? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not exactly certain, to be honest. I'm gonna have to check with my maternal child health unless uh, Paul Daly's aware of something I'm not aware of. Uh, I was just I, wondering whether yeah. it was done like, just like telemedicine in a, in a remote way or... Um, 
Dr. Levine and Senator Kitchell, it's Paul Daly. Uh, I did check with the program staff. They had said that for the existing clientele, they did move to tele uh, uh -huh. meetings, and those have continued at about the same level of activity as prior to the epidemic. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right, so we can move on then to uh, the next uh, section of the memo. Yeah, and there's not a lot to say really in the next session of the memo. Um, we can go into greater details, but there's a tremendous amount of federal funding going into the public health response to this pandemic. And um, it comes from a number of funds and it's been able to fully cover all of the work that we've been doing to this point in time. Okay. If we continue spending at the same rate, it will also continue through uh, the next fiscal year. And the next page, is there a next page? Okay. All right. Yeah, these were just to, uh, you know, we, we presented these in the uh, House Appropriations Committee uh, to really just update three projects that were authorized by legislation. Mm -hmm. Telehealth connectivity, COVID-19 related health disparities, and EMT and paramedic training. All of these are really in their inception stages, if you will, uh, with the first one, the telehealth, uh, working on a grant agreement with VPQHC for the project. On the second one, negotiating subgrants, and on the third one with the EMTs, uh, beginning to accept applications for tuition support. So these are all very early, but they are updates on prior legislation um, authorization for funds. So um, in, all, in all three cases, this ties into a question that Senator Westman was raising, is that money has been appropriated, but it's taking some time before it gets out the door. So in all three cases then, um, actual expenditures from these appropriations have yet to occur. Is that um, what is the situation here? Senator Kitchell, it's Paul Dooley, I can address that. That's true, no expenditures have been made, but uh, all of the, because the legislation authorized it, all of the grants will be, uh, they will reimburse costs that have been incurred since July 1st by the grantees. Okay. All right, um, committee, uh, questions of the commissioner. We might wanna get into maybe this, using this as an opportunity for a more general discussion um, other than the specifics. It sounds like your budget per se is um, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I would um, raise that has been brought to our attention and that is when we put together the hazard pay, which is being administered by the agency, we had uh, had the impression that salary adjustments um, had been made um, to all the identified um, uh, employees who were pro provide at risk of exposure to the virus. And then we subsequently found out that the adjustments only had been made for um, employees uh, uh, done by Metal uh, Dale and Metal Health, but that um, the alcohol and substance abuse uh, uh, clinical staff uh, that might be providing in person and at risk, um, we had, by virtue of excluding the DAs from eligibility, excluded um, employees that did not get any um, salary adjustment. Um, from the from your department or from ADAP, um, I, I don't know whether that has been brought to your attention, um, Sarah. I, I know that that's not being that's not being administered by the health department. It's being done. Um, I think someone from Diva is on loan, heading that up. Is, is that right? It's actually a secretary's office employee. Okay. So um, has that been brought to your attention? that the ODAP funded 
um, alcohol substance abuse um, um, staff out in the field that might be providing in-person um, services. I don't know how many, uh, what to the extent to which it has been done in person that provided a higher risk of exposure, but I just wanted to ask the commissioner or, or Paul whether that situation has been brought to your attention in terms of uh, those uh, the positions funded for the services that come through ADAP. Um, we uh, excluded because we thought that they were covered by these negotiated salary increases. And does, does this ring a bell with anyone? Well, it's kind of appalling that the, um, that the um, association would come to the department, uh, would come to the legis that I, I don't even know the extent to which um, you have had um, ADAP funded employees through the designated agencies that um, have been providing in-person um, uh, services. I think I'm, am I losing my committee? No. Have any of you heard this concern <laughs> that, that uh, we, Dale and mental health negotiated salary increases for hazard pay for selected employees, ADAP did not, and that the designated, and, and we had taken testimony, Sarah probably will remember this, from the secretary who said, please be careful, you don't duplicate. So we very specifically excluded um, uh, employees of the uh, designated agencies for that reason, because we had been told that these salary adjustments were being made. So I want to just bring to your attention that um, the, that, that um, exclusion of these um, clinicians um, has been brought to our attention. But I don't have a sense of uh, how many or um, a definition of the uh, need. And sounds like I'm, I haven't heard. I of remember that conversation um, during our talks about the hazard pay bill. Um, I don't remember a conversation about excluding people who might have. The question really was how much time did they actually spend with clients uh, or in person versus either remotely or by phone or whatever the other process. Yes. And that, that's where I got, I'm getting a little bit confused. Um, you know, do they have, do these individuals who work for designated agencies and substance abuse or uh, others have the records as to where they work? Because that was the whole idea behind it was frontline workers. And I wasn't realizing that we excluded certain people who had gotten a pay adjustment, but. We did, we did. And I, and I can speak to that because I was on the work committee that created the legislation. And we were cautioned by uh, Secretary Smith not to duplicate actions and pay adjustments that were also using the CRF grant money um, to um, provide uh, increased pay. And, and that was done for the mental health workers and the Dale workers. It's not just you work for a covered employee, but the job that you perform has got to be, uh, its primary function is that person uh, to person interaction that would place the employee at higher risk of exposure. So if it's being done by telemedicine, then there's obviously not that risk. And, um, and we had thought that, uh, so we very deliberately excluded um, employees of designated agencies for that reason, because it had been negotiated. The same as we did for municipal employees, because we provided a separate pot of CRF money to fund um, hazard pay for that group. Um, so I just bring it up, um, Paul and Dr. Levine, um, as something that has been brought forward to us. And um, I guess we need to have some more understanding of it, the extent to which um, in-person uh, services uh, were in fact provided by employees of the uh, designated agencies. So 
Um, I don't mean to, uh, uh, in light of the fact that um, I'm just bringing this situation to your attention and that it had, hadn't been brought to you before, I don't expect you to respond, but I, I want you to be aware that that was a problem that was presented to us, but I have no idea um, how many employees of designated agencies um, are funded by um, ADAP that um, would meet the criteria and that we should um, address. So, so is that something that Dr. Levine or, or uh, Paul should look into with? Well, we're gonna to need to because we're putting yeah. together um, a, a technical correction and we've found some other things that have to be addressed in that hazard pay program um, that um, uh, have cropped up obviously in the course of implementation. And this was one, and so we're um, at this point trying to evaluate it and figure out how to, um, um, how, to uh, um, how to deal with it through some kind of um, um, amendment to the bill um, language that we had. It was in, um, it was in the big healthcare bill, H965. We'll explore that for you within our ADAP section. That would be very helpful because um, uh, we're going to be working on those uh, technical amendments and need to um, deal with some other corrections. So I'd appreciate any um, any information that you can um, uh, provide. Um, other questions, Senator Sears, shall we go to your question about the testing then? That was. Uh, I think the the commissioner is fully answered to those of us in Bennington County, the issue of the uh, two forms of testing and the need why we do it. The question that I don't have yet is why certain people are charged for testing and others are not. And it appears that um, in the Manchester case, there was a $65 per test charge and then I heard that there are other places charging as much as $150 for a test. So I'd like to understand that there's nothing would inhibit people from getting the test more than uh, knowing that they're gonna get charged for it. And when uh, I had a person who came to me and said, I called my doctor um, to try to get a test and they told me <coughs> I might have to pay. And I said, well, you know, you should make sure that you call somebody else because that's not my understanding, but. So um, you wanna um, respond to that Dr. Levine and clarify, it sounds like we've got two different tests here and. Um, exactly, so we have the two different tests, one of which is the PCR, the kind of gold standard traditional test we do in our public health lab. And the other is the more novel antigen test. Uh, which is the one that M Manchester Medical Center has been doing. Um, the way the guidelines are currently written, the PCR test is covered completely, and the antigen test uh, had not uh, has not achieved that status yet. But aside from that, uh, it's clear that the Manchester Medical Center's practice is to not accept Medicare or Medicaid. And even Blue Cross Blue Shield, they indicate they're still ironing out some issues or whatever. Uh, so that most people who would have gone there for one of their antigen tests would have been told they had to pay for it um, just because of their practices alone with, with insurance. Um, it remains to be seen, and I, I presume we will evolve in our uh, looking at the antigen test as one that might very well be covered, but it would, should be covered in a very specific manner in terms of the indications for when that test would be appropriate. And in the next week or two, we'll be coming out with a, a health alert notification, which will further describe the antigen test and its role in the scheme of testing for COVID-19. And that will help clarify um, for everybody exactly what, where we think it plays a role and what the appropriate indications are. 
I think in, in, in at least in my experience with this down in Bennington County, a lot of people, because of quarantine requirements, were, tr were seeking a quick test that would give them a result almost immediately. And um, there, I, I don't know how long it takes now. I haven't had a test done recently, but we've heard stories that it takes uh, from <clears throat> Senator Westman that it can take four to six days to get the results, depending upon where you are in the state. And so I think that's why people went to the Manchester clinic because they wanted to get out of the quarantine situation and know quickly, but I don't know that for sure, but I know some people have gone that route. Yes. So this is probably not the test to be used for getting out of quarantine because by definition you're asymptomatic and the test is not, does not perform well with people who don't have symptoms. It's really meant for people in the first few days of having symptoms that are compatible right. with COVID-19. Right. So um, that's the answer to that part. With regard to the, uh, Senator Westman's um, larger issue, it really does vary across the state uh, tremendously. Uh, some hospitals have in-house platforms that they can run their own tests on that give results relatively quickly. Some don't. Some send to commercial labs. We're working with Vaz and with the lab directors to try to determine the best way to increase testing capacity within hospitals that want to have it, because some don't even have it at all. And we want to make sure they have a diversity of platforms so we're not vulnerable to shortages in national supplies and things of that sort. Um, the biggest issue with the turnaround time has been with the national commercial labs like LabCorp and Quest. I don't want to point my finger at them and say they are evil because they are just overwhelmed. That's nothing to do with them as much as being overwhelmed because when all of the states in the South and the West experienced their surges, they suddenly tried to get up to testing capacity where they should have been all along, but hadn't yet been. And they're having turnaround times in excess of a week, which is almost a worthless result if you're managing uh, an outbreak of, of positive tests. Um, so those labs are now starting to catch up. So that should reduce the turnaround time for them tremendously. We also work with the UVM Medical Center, as you know, um, that's sort of the triage site for where the tests are sent out to. Um, and the goal is that the more remote and community level hospitals get the same access as the partners of the UVM Medical Center get, those in their health network. And that is supposed to be true, um, but it doesn't always appear to work that way. Uh, so we're working with them to make sure that a hospital in Vermont that wants its results because they're testing somebody who's symptomatic and needs a result today um, gets that result uh, so that it, there's an equity situation across hospitals. So that's what we're working on as we speak because we are aware of the fact that some of these hospitals have really had to wait longer than we would want to feel comfortable with. So we're not we don't have our head in the sand on this. We're, we're quite aware of it and uh, working on it. And to the extent we can within the state, to the extent of these commercial labs nationally, it's more of their problem of trying to catch up as fast as they can. So, so um, uh, I appreciate Dr. that, doctor. Thank you. Um, so just to follow up, and then I see Senator Westman's got his hand up. Um, out of all the, out of the, what, four, 14 hospitals, 14, off the top of my head, out of the, out of the Vermont yeah. hospitals, um, do most have the testing, um, um, the lab capacity to do the tests? And the reason I'm wondering is, as we're seeing these, um, particularly colleges open up, schools open up, it seems like we're gonna see a great deal of demand for um, tests. And I'm just thinking the volume on these uh, national commercial um, it's going to just increase, and, and the more we have in-state capacity to manage our own needs is desirable. So 
Um, where are we now relative to what percentage of the hospitals are able to do their own testing? Is it half or a uh, um, handful or? No, I would say it's probably in the two thirds range, more than half. More than half. Um, Senator Westman. So uh, how does anybody know that walks in um, the lag time? Um, I've had some people come to me and say they waited six and a half days to get the results back. And that's within the last two weeks. And, you know, this is a timing issue. And if somebody um, appears to be positive, you're going to want to know quickly. So, and they walk in the door and they think, um, uh, they hear in the press conferences, 48 hours. So if, if you're in the group of people that are symptomatic, you should expect 48 hours at the, uh, at, at the longest. Um, that means most likely you've had your test ordered by your healthcare provider and they know where that test is going so they'll get the result back when needed. If you're going to a pharmacy um, or if you're going to um, a primary care practice that will take your sample because you have no symptoms and they don't have to worry about infection and all that, um, they may send it to a national lab, in which mm -hmm. case you may find it six days. Um, so usually the person ordering the test knows what they're, what they're getting into because they know when they want the result quickly and when they don't need it quickly. Now, if the patient is saying, I'm doing this test to get out of quarantine and I'm on day seven, obviously six days later is like, well, I did the full quarantine. It doesn't matter anymore. Right. Uh, so the goal is to get that test quicker. Um, I would hope that they would have been clear about that at the time they got the test done so that they would get it back quickly enough. I, I, I don't think they're, and what I hear from my local hospital is that they're having to send um, to Burlington to get um, 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 the tests, um, um, the an analysis done and the test done there. So, and it's that lag time in between. Yep. So, and, if, so if your sample's going to the public health lab, you're gonna get it back very quickly. If it's going to the UVM Medical Center and they're doing it, you'll get it back quickly. If they send it out, they almost send all of their other tests out to the Broad in Boston, and that's very quick as well. Um, they're not in the business of triaging to the commercial labs. But if you go to a federally qualified health center or a primary care office or a kidney drug, uh, anything of that sort, you may find that your lab is going to a commercial lab, in which case you're not going to get it back right away until they've caught up completely from their overloaded schedule so far. Um, and, but I, I would say to you, I think most people that are going to get tested um, have heard in the media that it's 48 hours. Yes. And they don't know when they go and where they go. Okay. And I might say to you and, um, uh, and call it, my local hospital, I, I've had two people talk to me that it took six days when they went to my local hospital. And the, did the hospital uh, have the capacity to, to analyze the they, specimen? No, they, they, did, they, uh, they did curbside and they sent, um, 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 they sent it on to Burlington and it took six days to come back. Really? Now that's helpful information. Thank you. Um, perhaps, uh, Senator Westman, you can provide... Uh, um, an, an email we could so we could look at what happened and where, where it was sent and you know Absolutely. why there was a delay um, and maybe you could send it to Paul and he can direct I, through the system. I will do that. Okay all right because uh, it seems like what we were uh, finding is there's great variability around the state we know with any other medical procedure there's great variability if you're being charged and that seems to be the case with the antigen test. And um, so um, it, it's helpful, um, but ideally then the patient would get this information from whomever is taking the sample so that they know 
um, uh, what the expectation of uh, return time should be. Um, but that, that would be in the ideal world, of course. Uh, other questions of uh, Dr. Levine? Yes, yeah, Senator Sears. You're muted, though. I unmute myself. Thank oh. you. I, I just wanted to say something um, about the Manchester case. And I have nothing but the greatest respect for the people at the Manchester Clinic. I've met them, I've talked to them. But I have to tell you that the Department of Health did a fantastic job um, with some criticism thrown in by others and et cetera. But uh, Dr. Levine, you, you know, what I saw you do and your Department of Health in dealing with that fear in the northern part of my district um, from people and how you calmed the situation down, you deserve some credit there. And I, I want to give you that while we're here today on this meeting. So I thank you for all you did to try to um, just calmly explain the situation to folks. I appreciate that. Um, you'll be hearing a little more about that in the near future, probably, because as you know, there was no major outbreak that we could determine. Right. Um, well, they, we continue I mean, to get sporadic cases uh, that we expect that. Right. Um, but uh, the investigation from the FDA angle isn't going to show anything tremendously wrong with uh, the machinery or well, anything of that sort. The problem was many of the businesses in that area chose to close once the news of an outbreak hit and you know, interrupted the reopening process. And I just need to give you some credit for your calm manner. And you came in there and, and really did a great job. And I thank well, you. Uh, you. Uh, let me... Too often I'm quick to criticize <laughs> administrators. Yeah, Senator <laughs> Sears, we've uh, made, made that you've, observation. You've ever noticed that? <laughs> yeah, but I think we've always um, had a great relationship. <laughs> um, you know, I don't I think, know about always. <laughs> it, I'm, I you. am sure that uh, the governor is. You have been um, incredibly valuable, and the governor is uh, respecting and valuing um, the science and the and the um, and your recommendations. And when we heard from the legislative economist, he talked about uh, actually because we get into this dichotomy that, oh, it's too tight, you know, they're strangling the economy and, you know, that national debate. Um, but our economists said that um, by virtue of having the lowest infection rate, the lowest hospitalization rate, et cetera, that the management of the pandemic has had a beneficial impact on the Vermont economy, as opposed to um, um, starting up too soon, et cetera. And I know that, um, we have uh, lots of differences of opinion. In fact, there are some people out there just like with anything else saying um, it's too tight, it needs to be liberalized, et cetera. But I, I did think that you should know from the economic perspective, uh, the, the approach and the advice that you've provided to, to the governor, which he obviously has taken very seriously does um, have an economic benefit to us as well, based on what we heard from our um, economists. So I, I wanted to um, convey that as as well. So it's not only just the public health, but it's and and I I don't know about other legislators, but in my area, compliance with the mask requirement is just um, yeah. incredibly um, good. It, I, d I can't even s remember seeing anyone without a mask as I've gone to either to the post office or to the local store. So I don't know what the compliance rate is statewide, but um, I would say based on what I'm seeing, people are in Vermont are taking the information that you're giving and the mandates and the advice um, very seriously. Um, so I, I just hope that that's the case throughout the state. Thank you. I think we're finding from other countries in the world too that uh, some of them are not getting the economic bang for the buck they anticipated uh, because of the way they reopened. And hopefully some of them are doing as well as you describe our economists talking about mm -hmm. Vermont's experience. Yeah. I, okay, I, Senator Starr. 
Well, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I represent uh, a pretty big ski area and Senator Kitchell does in Westman, um, Alice does um, in Dick. Uh, I was wondering, has there been much talk about what's going to happen later this winter uh, to, for the ski, uh, ski season? Yes, we have these meetings that are called restart meetings that happen several times a week, where literally every sector of state government, including public health, of course, is represented. And that, that group has been responsible for bringing recommendations to the governor as he opens the spigot little by little in various areas. And the ski industry was just brought up yesterday, actually. Um, and though we know that if the pandemic continues the way it's been going, the ski areas will not be what they used to be uh, in terms of the way they look and the way they have to operate, uh, they will still be in business. And our goal is to create um, the kind of setting where people can adhere to all of the appropriate public health recommendations and still enjoy the sport and have the industry still be a vibrant industry. So we figured uh, now that it's August, we do need to make our plans uh, happen with enough lead time so everybody's ready. Uh, but needless to say, we've been spending so much time on things that are more seasonal that we couldn't get to skiing yet. But it's been teed up as our next kind of area to uh, delve into. Yeah, well, good. Other questions of the commissioner or Paul? Okay. Um, one thing that um, people have talked about, and in, in, in some states, uh, the whole public health system has really been um, eviscerated over over time. It's been and a pandemic has really pointed out the importance of a robust public health uh, response. Um, one of the, um, and this got, it gets into some discussion that people are having, and that is how, as we're managing the crisis of the moment, how do we take um, this experience and, um, and the kinds of planning and the long-term uh, uh, systemic kind of changes that are gonna be, um, that have been, um, identified that really need to be made. Are you, uh, when you're talking about future planning, um, I, I'm sure that the whole question about the role of public health, of the uh, capacity of public health, um, change, what we, how we can take this and really strengthen the, the work that our health department does is a topic of, of also discussion. Can you just give us a little sense of how once we get through the get through the all the incredible pressure that you're dealing with now, how we take it and move forward in a in a way that um, gets us into a better place for the future. Yeah, so you know it's the Trump administration gets fingers pointed at it all the time, and we should continue to do that. But it's really a whole host of administrations successively. Right. That have literally eviscerated the funding for public health in our nation. Uh, a fair amount of short sightedness, uh, not anticipating uh, things that science has been talking about for decades. Um, even as simple as regular emergency responsiveness for public health, not a, not a pandemic on this scale that happens once in a century but even smaller things. Um, we've had the warning flags go up with H1N1, with Zika, uh, Ebola. Um, none of them were sufficient apparently to get people's minds really functioning in a prevention public health mode. Um, this one will finally do it, we hope, uh, and start that process of returning the funding to public health that has been eroded away for so many years. Um, just the money that's being spent federally now to support our efforts in the pandemic uh, tells a whole story by itself. Uh, but think if there had actually been an infrastructure already prepared for this uh, in a much different way. 
uh, that would have told told that would have been very telling as well. The fact of the matter is, our country spends a couple percent of its entire health budget on public health and prevention. All of the European countries spend in their teens percent, low and high teens on public health and prevention. And their outcomes speak volumes because their outcomes are uniformly better than the United States, which spends tremendous amounts, much more than any of those countries on health care, but not on health. So we have a lot to learn in a whole bunch of spheres and this pandemic should hopefully turn out well, but also be a, um, a sort of flag that goes up that really people can uh, look up to and say, we know what we need to do to protect our future and to become a healthier nation in general, not just guarding against these infectious diseases that will happen with more frequency, but guarding against a whole host of things that clearly we've not paid enough attention to over the years. So I think we're gonna see a huge change in that. Um, and you know, it's a shame that certain parts of our structures like the CDC are being made to look evil and bad and you know, uh, part of a hoax or what have you, and certainly not well informed or providing cohesive and coherent messages to the public. Because the reality is the rest of the world thinks the CDC is the preeminent public health structure that exists. Um, so we have a little work to do in the right direction, but I, I, I am fairly optimistic about uh, this message getting out there and people understanding where they should put their investments. Senator McCormick, you have a blue hand up. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, I wanna echo the compliments everyone's been paying you. It's uh, going back to when you were regularly testifying to health and welfare. We were impressed with your, your work. Um, well, the state has delegated to local school districts the questions of how to provide for safe reopening of the schools. So I know that this is actually not your mandate now. It's, it's the lo local uh, districts, but are you confident in what you're hearing and seeing coming from local school districts? Yeah, so, you know, we are pretty much linked at the hip with the Agency of Education. Um, you know, they didn't even dare figure out what kind of instructional um, apparatus needed to be set up around the state until the health guidance was was furnished to them. Uh, so I'm very confident about schools' ability to adhere to the health guidance. The health guidance is very broad. Obviously, it's not just disinfection and sanitization and proper cleaning protocols, but it's also how far apart the kids have to sit. Do they have to wear masks? It's also what happens if somebody comes to school sick? Uh, what do you do about that? And also is what happens if somebody actually has COVID? Do you close the school? Do you close the class? How do you respond to that? So it's a very broad health guidance. Uh, how do you operate a school bus in this era? How do you actually screen people at the door, whether they're staff or students, to make sure they're not coming to school ill? Um, so I could go on and on. There's a ton of that, and I'm very confident about that. But the next layer on that is how does the school actually operationalize all that and open up as a school? Is it gonna be in person? Is it gonna be remote? Is it gonna be hybrid? And how do they function in that way? And if it functions as hybrid, what do you do with the kids the days they're not in school? And that leads to the whole issues about childcare and parents being able to work or not work, et cetera. So it's a very, very complex set of uh, variables and circumstances but I'm pretty confident, to be honest, about our ability to operationalize it from the health angle, um, for sure. I don't, I don't think that's problematic. I think the most problematic thing is, do we have the staff in the school to pull it off? Because 
even though we are the lowest state for new cases and our lowest test positivity rate, we still have a lot of uh, anxiety, understandable anxiety amongst educators, amongst school bus drivers, amongst staff, custodial staff, what have you in the schools, um, uh, uh, administrative staff, they all have their own sets of concerns. And some of those concerns might mean that they can't be present in the educational setting. So do we have the staff to pull it off is a bigger issue to me uh, than any of the mechanics of it, if you will. So there are still unanswered questions. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Secretary French is still awaiting all of the school district's response to how they're opening. He had more than half of them the last time I heard from him. Um, so he's, he's awaiting just what kind of instructional plans do they have? And then he's also awaiting what are their staffing realities? Do they have staffing? Do they not have staffing, yeah, et cetera? We, I, I'm hearing from reopening skeptics who say that they're not sure we can get keep sh the kids' shoes tied safely or get their runny noses wiped safely. I mean, what do we, how do we yeah. answer that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not so worried about those things, to be honest, because generally, the, the physical distancing and the masking requirements are going to allow people to feel much more comfortable about the kinds of interactions with the younger kids that need to happen. Uh, my daughter actually teaches outside of Vermont in a place that has no business having their schools open because their positivity rate's higher, uh, but she only has a few people in the class and then a whole bunch um, in the hybrid mode. And she's been able to feel comfortable about keeping away from the kids, but also responding when she needs to respond, because that's a very <laughs> short duration interaction and uh, well, works out. One last question, if I may. Okay. If, you, if you're confident in the protocols for reopening the schools, could we uh, borrow those protocols and use them to reopen the state house? Oh, there's much of them that you could do, actually. Absolutely. However, that the question is, just like telework in all of state government, is when is there the absolute necessity to be in person versus it's just nicer to be in person because you're used to it and you can connect with people differently than when you do it the way we're doing it now. Uh, so I think it's more legislators determining uh, how critical the in-person environment is to accomplishing their work. And if it can't be accomplished in the ways that we're now learning how to use more and more technologically. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Senator Starr, you've got the last question. I'm looking at the clock. Um, yeah, I was just wondering in the uh, protocols, like for bus students, is the bus driver going to have a, um, a way to take the temperature of children as they get on the bus? Or is that going to be done when the children get to school? But I would think that the sooner something wrong is detected, the easier it would be to, to fix it. Great point. And I think originally a lot of people thought that the bus would be the best place for that to happen. Nip it in the bud if it shouldn't happen, send the student home right at that point. However, that was putting a lot on the staff that would be available at the level of the bus um, and probably more than they could bargain for. So the consensus was it was still going to be better off done at the front door of the school. It was just one of those reality test things that um, logistically wasn't going to be able to work well at the level of the door of the bus. Yeah, thank you. You guys thank are you. doing a great job. Keep it up. <laughs> thank you. Um, other questions of the commissioner or money questions of Paul? Um, if not, if something comes up, of course, we will um, be in touch and appreciate the information um, that you've provided to us. A lot of it is beyond the money, but it's really talking about 
well, in fact, what our um, state resources are doing for us. So we appreciate um, everything. And I see now we have Commissioner Baker and we're gonna move on to uh, corrections, which also has its own uh, um, COVID related uh, demands, I guess, or problems that they're managing as well. So thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Levine. And at this point, um, we're gonna move on to the Department of Corrections and their budget um, in, bye I bye. think, bye. Um, thank you. I think perhaps, do we have, uh, uh, and we have Matt D'Agostino. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, Matt. Thank you, Senator. Well, your chair didn't even get cold. <laughs> which I'm sure people are happy about. Um, it's the so best I, phone call I've received, Senator, since I've been at Corrections. Yeah, when he called me to ask my, if he could come my back. My question of you, Commissioner, I thought you said your wife was adamant that you would only be like a 90 day. Now, um, I've lost track of time, but um, did you negotiate a reprieve? I don't know. I celebrated my 45th wedding anniversary last Sunday, so I don't know what that says but um, I'm, I'm, I'm still home, so. Oh, well, we're glad you're home and we're glad you're still on the job. So um, do you have a document that you want to screen share or how did you want to uh, present? Um, oh, I see it. Okay, we have your ups and downs sheet here. Sure. Matt's, um, gonna take the, Matt's gonna take the lead, Senator, and then I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll help answer questions. Okay, we probably want to have a little more discussion in terms of what you're budgeting for out-of-state beds. I know Understood. that originally they were they're lower and uh, um, that gets into justice reinvestment yeah. uh, questions. So uh, we'll start with this sheet and then work through. Uh, Matt, as you know, this committee does not usually go line by line. We really want to look at the, you know, sort of the bigger um, things. We know that some of the internal service uh, charges are going to go down simply because of the rate uh, that that was adjusted. So um, I just want to let you know that we don't expect, um, nor, nor will you keep everybody's attention if you attempt to deal with the $47 or whatever there might be on some line. And it doesn't look like there's many changes here. Certainly no, correct, Senator. There's there's only three appropriations where we have changes, and I'm I'm we can start with the parole board. It's a very small adjustment. It's a, it's a travel reduction. Um, that's unless anyone has questions, we we can move on to correctional services and out of state, where I think the interest probably will be. Okay, is that fine with the committee? Yeah. All right, Senator Sears, you okay with that? Senator Sears. Yes. Go for a swim. Yeah. No, I wish I had. Um, but. okay, we're, we're now on to the, uh, correctional, this is correctional education next. Actually, I want to go back to that because the governor is still proposing to move high community high school of Vermont into the education fund. That's is correct. That, this, that's correct. This wasn't changed from the original 21 budget proposal. So that proposal yeah. is still there. It is. Okay. And that would be a total of three point, almost 3.5 million. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, we've sure had a lot I of discussion about this. that. Um, Senator just, Sears and I are great supporters and feel that whether you're incarcerated or not, you have a right to that education. <laughs> but this is a, a point of departure, I think, with some of our colleagues in the house in terms of, uh, how our education for these Vermonters is funded. But Senator Sears, you had a comment? Well, I have a question, I guess. In prior times that we put the funding into the uh, Ed Fund, we provided general fund to cover that funding so that it wasn't actually impacting the property taxpayer. In this case, you're moving, you're not moving any general fund over to the Ed Fund, am I correct? That's the way it looks to me. Yeah. Matt. I believe I believe so, Senator Sears. When when this proposal was originally included with the 21 budget, it was, I believe there was a there was a tax revenue, it may have been a sales tax revenue that was being redirected to Ed Fund, I believe, which was an increase to Ed Fund at the time. I believe that was that was the um, 
the logic right. behind this, this. I think was Kino. The original proposal had two pieces moved yeah. to the Ed Fund. One was about two million of child care, and the other was um, Community High School well, of Vermont. When and the, the bill Sears, you're referencing years, uh, how many years ago? And I think it was, um, we moved general fund at the time. Yeah, and then, it of was course, about six or seven, maybe longer ago. But then uh, we, we changed solved the, the problem. And then all the purists, purists of the Ed Fund came out and said, we hadn't solved the problem. Well, and then we had the uh, whole change in the way no, no general fund transferred to the Ed right. Fund anymore. Right. So. So uh, I'm sure this is going to be a topic of discussion, and I'm not sure what the House will do with it, but I, I'll flag it for the committee that this is uh, this is a recommendation. Um, well, I have a pretty good guess what the House will do. Yeah. Well, yeah. then they're going to have to find three and a half million to make it up. I can't, well, I, find, I can't find my blue hand, but just, you know, it, you were, it was always easy to justify moving, having um, the Ed Fund pay for young people up to the age of 21 because they would be entitled to, if they were on an IEP or something, be entitled to be getting education money anyway. So there was always, you could always justify that. And that's the way it was a long time ago. So I don't see that as such a problem to be paying for them. It was always an issue if you're paying for older people, but up to 21 for crying out loud, they're entitled to get ed money anyway, if they were in their school. Well, you've just joined Senator Sears and me, Alice. I have always maintained that we should be paying for them. The other, mm -hmm. the other people is a little more complicated, but certainly for them who don't have the diploma <clears throat> for them. Can you speak to that at all, um, Matt, in terms of the um, uh, enrollment of the community high school? It's an accredited <clears throat> school. This is it, the same as St. John's Bear Academy. It is an accredited um, uh, right. high school. Um, and I, I don't know um, in terms of um, the enrollment and the age. Do you have data on that, Matt, or Commissioner? So I, I, I do not, Matt. I don't think we do right right now. Uh, I, I don't have data. Let me know. Although I think that there is an entitlement if you don't have a high school diploma, yeah. even as an adult. You, I think you, we, ought to, we ought to get um, yes. see what our statutory provision, but I believe I could be 50 years yeah. old. I yeah. wish I were. Um, and still again, go. And, and still, still go. go. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So um, we should we, we, we should check that. Um, and I know that, um, who do we have on for joint fiscal support? Um, uh, it's Catherine, I'm here. Oh, Catherine. Catherine, Catherine, I see you. Um, if you could see if we could look at what the statute provides in terms of access to a high school diploma under Absolutely. Vermont law. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. all right. And, and Senator, we'll get the numbers of enrolled folks um, plus some idea of age. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, we probably should go to our next screen then, Chrissy. So in correctional services, the first two lines are offsetting that $1,860,000 expense. And it's, um, this is just a technical adjustment. The 30 new correctional officer positions that were created um, in the FY19 budget bill, sorry, the FY20 budget bill. There were no position numbers when the FY21 budget was put together. So even though there's no cost, the, the positions are offset by the savings from having the additional positions. We just put the technical adjustment in to show those 30 positions until we can actually include them in the, in the Vantage system. Uh, Senator Sears, you understand all that? I'm not sure I just got it all. You put them in and you took them out? So the, the positions were not, uh, didn't require additional funding. They were gonna be funded through savings in overtime vacancy and, and okay uh, all right I, I, I understand okay so they were already in the base it's just that we would get full-time classified positions and the uh, expenditures that we were making for overtime and temps etc would be available to support those classified positions That's but correct. and the status of those positions still are that they're under recruitment they they, they are vacant we are not at that point of filling those Okay, because you don't have the position numbers or? 
it, it's just that we haven't filled our vacancies that exist yet to get okay. to those 30, if that makes I sense. See. How, so, oh, so you've got not only these that have a, the new ones not filled, but you have a significant number of existing positions under recruitment. Correct. Yikes. Oh. We, have, we have 14 in the academy right now. And I can get you the number um, of what that would be for corrections officers' vacancies. I don't have it right here in front of me, but I can okay. get it for you. Okay. That would be helpful. Senator Sears, do you have any questions? No, on? I just sighed. I mean, it's just, it's an ongoing problem that exasperates oh, the situation. I know. It's people a, it's, are, you know, people are working 12 hour shifts, if not more. Um, and it's, you know, they're getting burned out and it just exasperates the situation. And, um, and it's a tough job, especially with COVID. Yeah. Uh, it is a very tough job. And in light of that communal nature um, in the facility. Um, and I know that hazard pay, higher pay had been negotiated for those positions. Um, but even that, I mean, you know, I can understand family being very concerned seeing oh. a family member going off to work in the oh. in a facility like that, and particularly when you hear about like things at Marble Valley or St. Jay or whatever, or, and people coming back from Mississippi. So <clears throat> I don't envy the commissioner. No, no. Okay. And then we've got the, uh, then we've got the um, COVID pandemic cost, and that would be the CRF money that has come to the department, um, at, uh, and it shows it in that column. Okay, almost uh, five million. Correct, and then this is for for things such as PPE, staff salary, other other COVID related operating yep. expenses. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'm sorry, I think I, I had missed uh, the, the health savings, health services contractors, their savings there of uh, one, one, three, 1.35 million, or sorry, 1.75 million. Um, this is related to the change from the previous contract that we had with Centurion to the current contract with Vital Core that was effective July 1st of, of 2020. There is a per inmate per, per, inmate per month cost difference. Um, between the previous contract and the current contract, which allows us to, to uh, reduce our, our overall budget in this area for the contract. May I? Yes, Dick. Uh, yeah, Matt, it, in today's Justice Oversight Committee meeting, there was quite a discussion about the medical director position, which has been vacant since, um, um, uh, I can't think of her name right now. Um, Dr. D, I think, was the... Dr. D left, um, and it's being filled 15 hours a week, and um, that it may cost more than what's budgeted to fill that position, because trying to find a full-time doctor at even 175000 might not be easy. Um, it can, is there room in the budget to make sure that we can do our best to fill that position if a person's willing I believe that there's there's some additional uh, funding that we could find for that position um, I, I don't know the mechanics of uh, it's well, not a classified position you, take all, the mechanics of you know when you take the 1.75 savings and you still have that important position vacant vacant I think everybody agrees that you know it'd be ideal to have full-time but Right now, I think you have 15 hours from a doctor that you're borrowing from someplace else. From Diva. <laughs> from Diva. So, right. you know, I'm just concerned that make sure there's enough money there to, to pay more if we need. If we found somebody who was willing and good, but needed an extra how many thousands, I don't know. So, Senator, after after the hearing this, this morning, um, Matt and I communicated, and, you know, I, I think... If it's a ten, fifteen thousand dollar bump, you know we could manage that within the budget. Okay. Okay. Seems like it's in light of everything, it's a pretty critical position. So yeah. good luck. But recruitment, I'm sure, is 
Well, incredible. as I said this morning, Senator, I, you know, as I said in uh, joint justice this morning, since I've been here, we've been trying to fill it. I've actively participated in that. I've talked to ex-CEOs from hospitals and it is not, we, we've interviewed one person. It just wasn't even a doc. It wasn't the right fit. It's very difficult to find someone to fill that position. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other connecting points from this morning's meeting, Dick? Uh, not on this okay. area. Um, shall we go down to the next section then? Um, a lot of this internal service funds, which you don't need to go through because we know that um, those all got adjusted 5% general fund. Um, so I believe, uh, sorry. So the, the out of state appropriation we're looking at right now, um, it probably looks more confusing than it needs to be. So we, what we've done is we've reversed the proposals from the original FY21 governor's recommended budget. Um, so the first, the first five lines effectively um, reverse the, the increase, the various increases and decreases in general fund for proposals related to that. Um, we, at this point, are unable to increase the U.S. Marshall beds or or uh, consider any any increase from a from a uh, per diem cost uh, change, at least until the pandemic is through. It would be prudent to to um, to not be trying to add <laughs> beds or increase the cost of those beds. Um, so our budget proposal is a reduction of the appropriation from the original 225 beds by 19 to 206 beds. And that's that bottom line, the $586,000 reduction. And we have how many right now that we're... As of today, there's 219 beds being used. Here's where it gets complicated. Yes, I was waiting for you, Senator Sears. Well, are all 16 beds connected to the decrease in the Marshall beds and therefore you're, um, do you have increased and are all 16 beds reduced on October 1st or are they throughout the year? You, you're, you're asking on the, marsh, on the Marshall beds. Well, I'm asking on both because there seems to be a, uh, you're gonna have an additional 16 Marshall beds, right? That would be the goal, yes. We negotiate that. And you're going to have a reduction of 16 out of state beds, correct? Correct. And then you have somehow you're going to fill the work camp in Caledonia by an additional 50 beds? I mean, that was the original proposal when we talked about this um, back in January. I know, February. but. But so we, you, I've I've heard I didn't go to any of the meetings, thank God. But no, but I they backed was, it out. They're reversing it. Oh, they are. That's I think that's what they're trying to say here. Reversal of the governor's proposal is being reversed. That's that's correct. Those those first five items, uh, the one point six million dollar oh. reduction through the uh, the last reversal, the one point right. three million dollar. Those five lines are are backed out. So we're effectively restarting with the. FY20 budget as it as it was passed, um, mm -hmm. and this is the only appropriation where where we could we could really just look at the bottom uh, the reduction from 225 to 206 beds. The restated budget effectively is the the only item in in this FY21 budget for us. So we're intent to have about 225 out of state next year. Yeah. Average, right? No, we're talking about reducing it from 206. 206. Yeah. 206. If, COVID, if COVID and the um, effort of Justice Reinvestment 2 starts to pay off in the third, third and fourth quarters of the three quarters budget, um, that would free up additional space. Am I correct? Yes, and if if the population continues today, our population is at thirteen ninety seven, and our detainees are at three nineteen, which includes the federal detainees. It's it's remained fairly flat. I mean, we had some spikes around holiday weekends, 
on detainees, but that number is hovered below 1,400 now. Um, for, for I'm just looking at projections of yeah, I'm, maybe reducing I'm, by more than um, 16 beds. So what, what we're doing right now, Senator, on this piece about the out-of-state beds, obviously the COVID positive test in Mississippi complicates the conversation for us a little bit more. And I can, you know, I know there's an interest in those numbers and I can give them to you in a minute. What we're trying to do right now on paper is figure out how we can move some of that population back sooner than later, uh, especially the vulnerable population. So the reason why I tell you that is, I think it will give us a sense of how well we can manage the population back here with an additional number coming back um, sooner than later, if that makes sense. With yeah. no, no promises we can do it, but I do have staff right now working numbers to figure out where in the system can we find space without compromising our quarantine medical isolation protocols that we use to keep our facilities clean. Uh, the next question becomes, where does the 500 and I'm having a hard time reading it. 900 and 586. 586 go. Does it it's go a anywhere? savings? It's well, sa it's a savings. Does it get reinvested? That's the question. No, no. That's that that is our our commitment to cut the budget. That's a budget cut that we're we're but, taking. But that's not something sure. that correct, I Matt. could agree to. Matt, that's I'm correct, correct right? That, that's correct, yes, Commissioner. Uh, but we do have the other investments we made by in the other bills on the community side using CRF for this year. Is that, uh, Dick, you worked on that. So Yeah, we, but I'm just concerned that we're not, here we are not reinvesting 585,000 into community-based programming. Mm -hmm. but we that's can, just a bad that's, precedent. I mean, I think we, if we're really going to do justice reinvestment and we have to res reinvest savings, I mean, if if we got down to 150 beds out of state, then we should be reinvesting the savings from that, that 56 yes. beds. So that's, you. this is exactly the question that I've been raising is uh, with this bed change, how, how were those savings reflected in the budget. And right now they're helping the bottom line. Um, yep. But uh, obviously that's an area we're gonna have um, more discussion. Um, I don't know what the, um, uh, and Dick, you probably ought to have some discussion with your um, counterpart in the house too, because um, how they're gonna look at this, I think can be helpful. Well, I believe um, I have a Saturday morning conversation with Representative Hooper. Uh, is she your, um, I didn't think she did the corrections. I thought that was the, um, I thought that was Chip Conquest who had corrections. I, I Representative, was, Representative Hooper has us, Senator. Oh, she does? Okay. She wouldn't less, give them up. Less than it changed. Okay. She wouldn't All give right. up the corrections. And the only thing that we can do is look at, um, um, the other governor's proposal of where we want to increase spending. He's got a couple of initiatives and we may want to um, set priorities in terms of, uh, of ultimately the budget. So uh, we can talk about that a bit more. Jim. Well, I did, I'm concerned it's not a huge amount of money. I am concerned about the precedent it sets mm -hmm. after passing Justice Reinvestment Two the first opportunity of reductions in beds from out of state are going to the bot to reduce the bottom line. And that's a concern about a precedent. And um, clearly we can follow what Kansas did and have a mess and then blame everybody that justice reinvestment didn't work. But if you don't reinvest, you don't get the benefits. All right, well, um, there are a couple of proposed areas of increase and we'll just have to set our own priorities on this. Um, one is um, 
Uh, the governor is again proposing exemption of military retirement, and that carries um, that that has um, cost implications. And the other was the downtown tax credit. Those are uh, two that I can remember off the top of my head. So um, we just have to look at that. The, uh, look at how we uh, um, if we if we don't want to take this reduction, then how do we fund it? So um, other discussion other than how this uh, connects um, to justice reinvestment. Um, the budget right now has how many beds is budgeted for how many beds again, Matt, can you tell us? 215, did you say? It, it was, it, it's 225. Uh, well, currently, um, before we look at the restate, restated budget. Okay, so we are talking about a reduction right now from current uh, base budget of 225 down to 206. So you're, you're anticipating a reduction of, um, of these beds, of 19 beds. Correct. Okay, thank you. But again, uh, these numbers assume that the 19 people come out on October 1st, I think. This, this is this is annual. This is an annualized. So the the two hundred six beds would be the would be the base appropriation for for the full FY full year FY twenty one. So I, I think to your earlier point, Senator, we're we're a little we're a little bit higher right now. But as we as we see justice reinvestment and, and other components working and reducing this population, we may go below the two hundred six. But it, it'll if we go below the 206 by a few, it'll average out to 206 for the year. We wouldn't okay. have significantly more savings until we were, were substantially less than but that. Do you get my point, Matt, that if justice reinvestment is to work, you got to reinvest money? Yes, understood. <laughs> but, but, Senator, I, Senator, I hear you on this. I, I think the challenge for us in putting this budget together that we presented to the governor in, in uh, in COVID environment, the COVID environment right now, there's not a lot of other places to try to find money to take off the bottom line. I mean, that was our challenge. It's not- Understood. I not understood, I understand your challenge, Commissioner. I just am, um, no. Yeah, but, but I wanna just make the statement, Senator, it's not that from where I sit, we don't support reinvestment. Um, we do support reinvestment. I think we've had some conversations internally about areas that we can start working on that can in fact help us cut down on um, the population in state, which will allow us to bring even more folks back, which will be, be the savings that will get reinvested. That's I think we all agree that, are there $400,000 there for batter intervention programs somewhere in your budget? That was Did it, we that, fund that through CRF? That is funded through CRF, yes. Right. Okay. I can grant you a pass on on that part anyway. That that's an important community investment. It's, and the other, it the other seems one, to get Dick, you put together and we can look at it again because uh, it's hard to remember. It was what a million and a half, two million dollars like that, yes. For pieces that we we funded in a prior um, we've done so many budgets and bills this year. It's hard to keep them all straight. Yeah, if somebody can just get us back that information. So if Catherine um, could, from the joint fiscal perspective, just give us that package that we already funded to support this first year of, of, of justice reinvestment, that would help, I think, refresh our It makes our things a little easier to swallow. Yes, I, yeah. I will track it down and get it for you. All right, thank you. So there are a couple other points, I think, just... Um, I wasn't aware that that money, I thought that money came out because I'm getting confused on skinny budget, total fiscal 21 budget, number one. Number two, um, we are um, through savings that we can find also working on um, what I briefed you on, on focused deterrence with uh, Professor Kennedy from John Jay, focused on the high risk domestic violence folks. 
which is the focus on supervision in the community, the cut down on, uh, especially in furlough situations, um, the, in, in probation situations, the cut down on re-entries into the system. I'm hopeful that as we get through this, moving into this fiscal year, that we're gonna start seeing that work start to pay off. And that was the whole, and that's the whole logic behind the whole reinvestment activity. Quickly, if I may, I apologize. I may have misspoken about the batterer intervention. We had uh, 327,000 in CRF that was uh, going to the network against domestic violence. Um, I think they were two different, two different conversations that were happening. I said, yes, we had it. I wasn't referring to the batterer intervention per se. It was the, the money that's going to uh, domestic violence and, and um, the 13 accountability programs related to, to that. That was CRF funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we had to put it out in a way that was permissible for CRF use. So, uh, but we, st we need to go, go back and, and look at what that package of uh, services and funding that we did previously just to help us with this discussion. That's helpful, Matt. But if you remember, maybe you had left and just came back, but the discussion sent on the batter intervention program centered around the uh, fee that was charged to the batterer to attend the group. And previously there had been no fee um, and that was covered by state funds. And so you had a lot of people not participating because they either couldn't afford the fee or they didn't want to pay the fee or whatever. So uh, that was the attempt there. That's the one that I'm talking about. Matt, you know, you're looking at. Uh, um, is that a question, Dick, or um, uh, I'm, I, I everybody's kind of looking at the question is that at one point, back when we were in the building, I think we had discussions about the four hundred thousand dollars. I think we were all in agreement that what had happened and transpired in the previous administration, shifting the cost to a pay-as-you-go for batter intervention wasn't working and that we needed to fund it. And a lot of good programs dropped out because they didn't want to collect or couldn't collect from the participants. That was the, that's the 400,000 I was talking about. So I don't believe that that did make it to our budget. I, I, I apologize. I, I wasn't present for those conversations. I think they did happen. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. So why don't we um, put that on as something to get more information on? Please. Certainly. But Senator, we may be talking about, we may be talking about the same thing in the CFR money. I'll work this out with Matt. Um, in my conversations with Karen, um, I just got to recover that conversation in my mind. But I, we may be, that that um, that may be the CFR money, but we'll have to uh, we'll have to work with Matt on this. Okay. Other comments or questions? Other committee members? I uh, I only got this um, sheet. Glad to see you're all still here. Um, okay, Senator Westman. Um, you have nothing. Senator Ash, you're, you're on, but muted. Um, I'll just say that I can respect that they have to take their orders from the fifth floor, but it cannot be called justice reinvestment if we do not reinvest the money. And so I think we really do have to think about other ways to fund whatever else they wanna do because it is a complete betrayal of the entire justice reinvestment process to not reinvest those out-of-state uh, bed savings and we just received the letter today saying that they're following up with the phase two of justice reinvestment. And I don't know what message it sends to them if we're immediately walking away from the first steps. And I, if I were the feds, I wouldn't come in with any dollars to follow on because we've just shown, we would be showing that we're not committed to this for the long term. And I don't mean to be pugilistic, but I know departments have to come in and take direction from the fifth floor, but 
we don't have to hear both sides of it. We have to either stick with the plan or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is, to me, this is the conversation that we knew was um, before us. And so um, the, you have a proposal. We understand the, the, the position you're in, Commissioner and Matt, and um, we'll, uh, um, Senator Sears will have further conversation with his House counterpart. And uh, um, we will look at priorities that we have versus priorities that uh, are requiring funding as the, in the budget as proposed and um, make our decision. So thank you on that. that. I noticed the chair takes great glee in letting know that I will have further conversations. I, Dick, I know you'll be your charming self and you'll deliver whatever whatever on our behalf we I look think forward it's big, one of we those big forward. <laughs> we look forward to the uh, results of your saturday um discussion no powwow uh-huh um other uh questions is is that the last um up and down sheet Matt? that that's right that, that we that's that was everything yes we so we've tortured you through completion, okay. Other questions um, of, of corrections? Obviously, we are, um, we're, we are very committed to the justice reinvestment um, um, uh, legislation that we passed. And, um, and so, I'm sure you're not surprised in hearing some of the questions and concerns that were raised. Um, and um, so we we will be looking at that closely and uh, it has nothing, we understand that the position you're in, I've been in it before and um, um, know that um, you are having to make the decisions that uh, that, is, that are necessary um, on behalf of the administration and we appreciate that um, and we will, evaluate this proposal and figure out what we go from here. Uh, are there questions of, of, of the commissioner and Matt? Anything more that we haven't covered that you want to brief us on in terms of what you th think has gone well? Obviously the management of the, um, for Vermont inmates in terms of the um, prisoners and it, that seems to have gone well in terms of the isolation. It was very, very, uh, there was a big, uh, um, outcry, obviously, from the St. Johnsbury area when uh, the transfer of the inmates came to the uh, facility. But in the end, that seemed to have been, from a public health perspective, um, the right thing to do. And uh, nothing, it seems like there's not an issue now. But are there any other um, situations that are, we might want to know about or things that are going well or things that you're um, finding particularly challenging right now in this environment? Yeah, I, I think um, a, a few things, and I did speak at Joint Justice today, so I, I don't want to bore Senator Sears with what I talked about earlier, but I'll talk a little bit about COVID. Um, we, we just, yes, um, I got to get my days right. Two days ago, the 18th, uh, we retested Marble Valley and Rutland again, and that really was a result of the six inmates that came back from Mississippi and um, who ended up uh, with another infected inmate plus two of our staff. Now, two of the staff were, were fairly symptomatic, uh, been out of work. Um, they're okay, they're not hospitalized. It's been a little bit challenging for them. Um, I've spoken to them several times, checking in on them. Um, clearly in that situation, we learned a lesson. Um, we believe as a result of the contact tracing, uh, there was a breakdown in protocol that ended up with um, the two staff getting affected, um, but the contact tracing was able to stop that in its tracks. And I'm happy to report that that facility is now clean. Um, and uh, we only have one inmate right now that's in any type of medical isolation within the system in Vermont. Um, that's the good news. And as I said, um, as I said at, at uh, Joint Justice today, um, you know, there's, there's staff that are working 
14, 16 hours um, managing this. And um, they get all the credit for keeping our system clean. I do want to touch on something Senator Sears said a few minutes ago. Um, I, 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 and I, I, I reported this in our, our staff meeting within AHS this morning. There, there is, um, I had meetings with labor management yesterday. Uh, I do a weekly call with the entire state. Anybody that the department can get on, ask me questions. We brief them what's going on. Um, yesterday, we briefed them about the budget. There's, a, there's normally 140 to 160 of the employees on. And um, those calls are very helpful for me because it gives me a sense in this COVID environment where I can't get around the state. It gives me a sense of morale. And um, our, 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 our staff is being pushed to its limits as many state, state agency staffs are. Our, our security staff is tired and um, they're working mandatory overtime. Um, we have lost staff as a result of family members worried about them being exposed inside facilities. And we're, we're working as hard as we can to maintain the security of the system. And so I, I, want, I want to bring that up. Uh, I, I want to also talk a little bit about Mississippi. Um, we have 219 inmates down there. And in the end, 84% of our inmates tested positive. Uh, 184. Um, that, uh, that, that was very disheartening um, as this unfolded. And uh, I've, I've been in conversation with the CEO of, of uh, Core Civic and, um, you know, uh, been responsive. But, but clearly, as I told him, this should have never happened. The challenge in Mississippi is, is that the county that the facility sits in is, leads the country. It's the 10th county in the state for community spread. And so I have another conversation with the CEO tonight about some other um, points that uh, we would like to see them do. And we're hoping to have staff back on the ground in Mississippi next week to make sure that the protocols we're insisting on are being followed. Now, the good news out of the bad news is, is that um, out of that 184 that were positive, there's only one that remains in the, in, uh, in, in the infirmary. Um, we had four there at one point, and they've been moved back into medical recovery. Um, a good chunk of the 184 um, have shown no signs at all, and they're back in medical recovery now, what we refer to as medical recovery, which is a step down from medical isolation. And one, one inmate remains in the hospital. Um, um, he has been there for a couple of weeks. And um, the reports that I get twice a day are showing that he's improving and the challenges around his O2 saturation. So um, that's a report from Mississippi. Um, and uh, we're, this is escalating our conversation internally about um, how to better manage that population. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's the update there. And um, a lot of stuff I sh shared with Joint Justice today, I won't repeat um, when it comes to accountability uh, and um, the opening of the Office of Professional Standards. Um, we are focused now on our hiring process, focusing on equity, impartiality, and, uh, and fairness in our system to include our employees. We're working with uh, Tabitha Moore, the president of the NAACP in Rutland to raise the bar when it comes to equity within our system. There's a lot of our stuff going on, a lot of other stuff going on. I won't take up time. I'd be more than happy to talk to folks about it um, because I know you got a lot of issues to deal with with the budget. So, so that is really a snapshot of what's happening. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that update. And I realize, I think Senator Sears probably was, he, is the only member of this committee who um, right. has had to listen twice, but sometimes repetition is helpful. And we rely on him to keep, keep it all in his uh, inventory of knowledge. So thank you very much um, for, the, for that update as well. Um, other questions um, at this point? Um, Matt, anything else we need uh, from your perspective? I think we've covered everything. Thank you, though. All right. Yep. So, committee, um, Thank you. we are um, finished with testimony for today. Um, 
we have time for discussions. Um, I don't know at this point, uh, uh, you're free to, uh, to leave the meeting at any time. Um, thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Senators. Have and, a good uh, day, Senators. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, Before we go to something else, can I just ask, do we have a all Senate phone call today at four? Yes. yes. Okay. What did that come on? Do you know? Did it come by? It was an email from uh, Peter. Email from Peter. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, uh, yeah, I've got. Okay. Um, I was uh, Peter Sterling. It okay. came uh, yesterday, Wednesday, 404, just to help okay. you in your. Yes. Sometimes thank you. It, get, it gets lost. Thank you very much. Yes. And he had also sent out uh, another email just before that. Um, on the um, uh, floor schedule. Yeah, for next week. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, on Wednesday earlier, he uh, said that there would be a call at four and hope yeah. people can participate and, um, and that we're going to, um, what we'll be doing next week. Mm. And do you know, do, do you know Jane or, or uh, Dick, um, when our staff is going back to work, our committee staff people? Uh, I think as soon as you let them know. Uh, Mike Farron asked the other day if, if people would let him know when they wanted to meet committee chairs. So I think if you contacted Mike, he could, Mike or Peggy. Yeah, I... I, I I'm meeting... Wednesday and Thursday this next week. Yeah. I wasn't sure what time we'd get done Tuesday, but I, he, uh, of course, it's kind of easy for me because Peggy's full time, but he said something about making sure to ask him and he and Peggy would see what they could do to get your committee. Because we're going to meet available. in a probes every afternoon, but we still have, or are we going to meet in the morning too, Jane, do you think? I, um, at the end, we might have to meet all day, um, but at this point, uh, we're doing afternoons the same as we would. Yeah. Um, and next week, we'll have to determine, um, you know, are the te testimony. Um, and people are asking, and let me, uh, we know that this session is, it's going to be driven by getting this uh, budget for the third, uh, last three quarters completed. We know that we have to have a budget in place by October 1st, just like we had to have a, you know, by July 1st. So um, we are going to have to, if you want a back plan from October 1st, we're going to have to have a budget wrapped up by um, September 25th. So oh, if people, okay. so people we, need to we, understand we, that the, uh, for other committee work that the getting the budget completed is what's going to drive the uh, timetable of how long we're in session. And we are absolutely have to be um, uh, completed. So we have a budget in place um, by the 1st of October. So <clears throat> that's why we have the two hearings scheduled for next week. And um, hopefully, I think the first week of September, um, the House, you know, that's pretty aggressive. Um, and then it would give us um, time. And then uh, if we have a conference committee, so uh, if we were to just as a tentative uh, deadline, have a budget completed by September 25th, um, we can back plan from there, but it's gonna be the budget. And, and I know that um, Senator Ash had sent out a list of bills yeah. Um, that will move forward, but not every bill is going to be acted on within this compressed period of time. No, that I, I would hope that we were done this stuff by the end of September at the latest. Well, we have to be. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think leadership wants us to meet after the budget's completed. And the three budget, weeks. So after, so the absolute deadline is October 1st. But we would oh. want to get a budget completed for the governor either to sign or, and has happened in a couple of years, become law without signature. Uh, we have to allow some time. Well, if, if Tim would 
tighten up the other bills so they don't keep us down there for another week after. Uh, we should just do the darn budget and go home. With well, all that's... due respect, Senator Starr, the other the the bills are in the other body that Senator Ash doesn't have much control over. Yes. And that will probably be the topic of discussion um, this afternoon exactly. at the four o'clock and with the chairs um, in terms of uh, what bills will see action because obviously this came up at the Legislative Management Committee and um, the, the speaker was you know, pretty adamant. And this is just because we've got four weeks if something has been on the wall and not seen any action, I uh, don't think you're gonna take it up now is sort of the message. Yeah. Well, but they're, you know, typical. Um, well, uh, so- I got two little bills I'm taking up next week. Alice, I can't be at the meeting. So it's just the two little bills that Tim asked the Senate Judiciary to work on. Then we'll work on trying to understand what the House is doing to our use of force bill. Okay, what are the bills? Does somebody know other than you? Oh, um, He'll send you an email. Send me an email. Relief, that... of, relief of abuse. Oh. Relief from abuse. It's H96 something and a bill dealing with driver's license suspense. And I don't know why they're so important. Either one of them are. Well, okay. I shouldn't say anything. Are you not there both days? What do you mean both days? No, I'm there next week. I'm talking about tonight at the chairs meeting. If oh, you're oh, going, oh. if the all caucus meeting oh, the all brings caucus. up what ju judiciary is doing, I won't be there at the all okay. Senate caucus. Oh, okay. That's so you I'm, won't be you won't be at the all caucus, and you won't um, all member caucus, and you won't be there for chairs as well. Then no, I'm protesting down at the four corners. No, seriously, I've got, a, I'd already made prior plans. That was the chair's meeting. Is that, can people listen in? Uh, I, you're, the, I, I, you're the vice chair, right? I'm the vice you could chair. go I, I, in my place. What time? I think that, uh, that would, it's just going to be a continuation after oh. the all member. Okay. So I think you're allowed to go in my place, Alice, because you're the vice chair. Yeah. Thank you. So, okay. See where my um, is. So now we've uh, had uh, some other, in terms of the budget, any further discussion? Well, I, I, I would support uh, that reinvestment of those dollars uh, that Dick was talking about uh, into the community so these people won't get back into prison. Um, you know, and I, I, I don't think that's a good use to cut to cut the overall expenditures to take that money and and put it um, to reduce the budget and not, and then have these uh, people out there that we've let out of prison with no support. Thank you, Bobby. I thought Senator Ash put it very well. Yes, he did. He, mm -hmm. We passed it, and we're taking it seriously, and we. This is really going to be an evidence of our commitment. Yes. Uh, so other comments? Uh, and we, in terms uh, by the way, we just got the $500,000 federal grant to have them work with us the next two years on the implementation of justice reinvestment. Yeah, I, I know. That's, Tim referenced the, the approval of that, um, yeah. which is really important. Um, we're we're going to just, uh, we're kind of doing law, um, just as the house takes testimony, then we will schedule. Um, we, uh, they did take some testimony from the Vermont State College. Do you want to see if we can schedule having the new chancellor come in? Uh, we, and um, when we did the, oh, I think it was the Q1 budget, uh, we added seven and a half million of CRF money. Um, and they're working on ways in which they can use that. At the seven and a half was to help with that bridge funding um, need. And, um, and so uh, um, that are people interested in having the yeah. State College come in and talk to us about the progress? I would assume Senator Starr and Senator Westman definitely, because obviously the um, couple of, and McCormick and Nick, I mean, Orange County and Randolph is certainly, I think you must have 
Randolph. So, no. uh, yeah. You would uh, the preservation of the Randolph campus is, I would think, important, even though it's in a, an adjacent county. That's right. It's very important. Okay. No, that um, would be great having having the new chancellor in. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll. The, uh, um, anything else in terms? I, I know, Rich, I would, you got your hand up. I would just say that um, I, I I certainly would like to have um, um, the state colleges in indefinitely, but I think it would be a good time to get a little update from all of higher ed um, because, as they talked about earlier in the year, if are we going to experience a, a drop off in students? They talked as much as 20% and coming back in September, they'll know what this looks like. I, I think we ought to get just um, a, a presentation about the overall health of all of this. Thanks. Are you talking about both UVM, VSAC and? Uh, yes. Um, okay, so um, just higher ed update. Yep. What about the private colleges, Richie, that need I, help I, I, with, I absolutely, with testing I, and getting started up and all that. I mean, I, I, there's a I, lot of I, concern I, here in Bennington about Bennington College coming back and students. Well, we did put money in. Remember language that we yep. added that would um, help them provide yep. the funding for the testing of those students, which was a request from the independent colleges. Yeah. I, um, I think a general update of all of higher ed, privates, publics, everything would be a good thing for us to do. Because if they, if there really is a drop off of twenty percent of all students across, it's going to have a huge ripple effect that we're going to want to um, walk into with our eyes open. I think Castleton is already reporting that it's not as great a drop off as they thought, and there are more coming than they expected. Then, if that's the report, I think Could that's be great. great. If that's yeah. the case for others too. But but we also yeah. I will will speak from um, my employers, um, VSEC. We also put money in to bolster the grants because families' incomes are down, and right. we did right. that. And that money for the a, a lot of that money will have to be spent by December. But does that mean the second half of the year that um, those kids are going to have smaller grants? I you know. I think all of that we need to look at. No. Um, well, they've only got so much money, so uh, yeah. we may have to understand that the extent to which there are resources, unless the federal government gives us additional money, um, we've made the appropriation in anticipation of that as it relates to um, particularly the VSAC demand. Um, but there's also um, additional um, uh, propose money and including helping if more uh, courses are done remotely uh, for some students, they need to have help with the technologies to support uh, remote learning. And so they are using, uh, they have some money um, for that as well. And then there is um, another provision. It was something actually the Senate uh, put in place and that was to help um, students with expenditures, emergency expenditures, sometimes a car repair or help with rent can make the difference whether they can um, continue to stay in school. And so um, it may mean with uh, less employment this summer, we have more situations where students have that kind of financial hardship or emergency that makes mm -hmm. the difference whether they can stay enrolled or not. Mm -hmm. I'm so, wondering uh, if, if Castle, uh, and what uh, Alice just reported regarding Castleton leads me to the question for the state colleges would be, what has been the impact of the discussion about saving or closing the state colleges following Jeb Spaulding's announcement? Yeah. And is that why you've got more people going to Castleton because that's the one that was gonna stay open and people that wanted to take advantage of the state college system. And so you've had a drop in enrollment at Lyndon and Johnson or whatever they're called now. Yeah, could be. So, so, it would be so a, if that would be a question that they could try to answer, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is the, you know, what do you call it, Richie, when people apply to college? Yeah, I mean, application. Applica our application down at those colleges. Yeah. All right. So, um, all right. We'll schedule higher ed um, some time on that. 
Um, some of it's going to be an update in terms of what we've done in terms of moving money that way and what the experience to date has been. Um, sometimes it's hard to know. For example, um, we put money out in an earlier bill to help uh, towns if they had to borrow money because uh, to make the education payment, people hadn't paid their taxes. But um, the default rate on taxes, at least this spring, uh, I, that never got used. So um, sometimes it's good to go back and say, did what was the need and um, and and um, um, the other um, area that we uh, know, for example, and we need to get an update and we're gonna be making modifications to our hazard pay, but um, it's on a first come first serve. Uh, we tried to do the estimate of eligible employees um, uh, the best we could. It wasn't intended to say we're all, we only intend to you know, meet a partial need. Our goal was to provide an appropriation that um, would fund the benefit for the estimated number of employees. So um, if in fact um, more uh, our estimates were off, then we may need to go in and look at adding some more money to that because that was a concern around uh, the message that went out from the agency. And that is, uh, it's this is a first come first serve benefit. And uh, that is what you've got to do so you don't overspend. But if it means that we have eligible employees that are have provided those essential services and our estimates were off, then we need to go in and, and um, adjust for that. Yeah, um, are, any, are any of you getting any uh, comments from your school people in regards to testing for COVID at schools and I mean, some people are saying that there isn't going to be any testing and they're all nerved up. Uh, it seems to me that that is something that the local schools are having to address in their planning. That That's, yes. uh, so I haven't received anything. But according to Dr. Levine today, they're going to, part of their protocol is to test the students and staff, I would hope, as they come in to school each day. At well, they're doing a, a temperature, but they're not doing a COVID test every day. No, no, but that that tells if you're sickly or not, right, real quick. Uh, but some of them are saying, oh, there isn't going to be any tests given, and they're... Oh. You know, very nervous about with uh, their local schools. I mean, well, I when we're getting into education and that those kind of protocols, I guess we can talk to at the chair's meeting um, what the education committee is going to do in terms of getting education on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, other um, comments in terms of we will um, schedule witnesses for other parts of the budget as necessary. We want to do more with higher ed. Um, and we uh, know that we're coming back on the hazard pay because as any bill, um, when you're setting up a new program, it, it, some things need to be um, adjusted. I was rather surprised that, um, that we were getting a request on the substance abuse workers being left out um, and there'd been no communication, I, I gather, with the Department <laughs> of Health. Um, so. And I don't know how many of those workers are, in fact, are doing in-face um, service. Obviously, with the um, developmentally disabled and they've got group homes and so forth, there's a lot of right. direct care and um, in-person services. So we'll have to quantify. A lot of that um, is remote. And I'm not sure that those workers understand that the remote doesn't count. I'm wondering about that, Dick. It, just because you're working... Um, we made yeah. it very clear that if you're doing that service remotely or telemedicine me a method, then you're you're not um, in right. in that uh, in person um, at risk situation. So there may be some confusion because some people think, well, because I work for a covered employer, right. I automatically am covered, and that's right. not true. It's the nature of the job that that employee is uh, performing that puts them at an elevated risk of exposure. Mm -hmm. So Sam McCormick, you have your hand up. Yeah. From time to time, sort of ad hoc, an issue will come up, but I, I'd like 
to develop just a list of the classes of people who have fallen through the cracks. You know, it seems to me we've actually done a pretty good job as a state of addressing the, the problems that this has caused people economically. But, you know, there, for example, I think people who had difficulty getting benefits back in the spring, most of them have now gotten the benefits, but they're having trouble getting reimbursed for what they missed early on. Are you talking you know, and, about and, like unemployment? Uh, unemployment and, and the federal um, uh, uh, stuff that, that the state administers. Uh, you know, when, when people were just spending six and seven hours on, on hold on the phone and, you know, they would go online and just get nowhere. Um, most of those folks are now getting some kind of aid, but there were periods of their of months where they were not, and they would like to be reimbursed for that. In some cases, they made, you know, personal loans from family that they want to pay back. Um and, I don't. And, uh, I don't know where that data is being collected. I haven't. Uh, um, no. uh, um, uh, we can ask the UI. They put out a daily report. Um, I don't think they know. I don't think they know. Well, I, so yeah. my point is, those are questions, but I don't know uh, where we would, where in state government, um, any yeah. such information. Yeah. Um, well, I was just thinking that, that that everybody on this committee just just bring in their stories next time we have a committee discussion and we just because that would then determine who we, we want to before we give these agencies money we might want to talk to them about it are you going to use this money to straighten out these problems and i, and I gotta say they don't always they're not the ones to ask because about what the problems are because typically i, I get the complaint from the constituent i get on the phone and the bureaucrat denies that it's even happening you know well. <laughs> or, or yeah. I think where there is a big problem is with people getting through to the adjudicators. There are still people stuck out there who are waiting for adjudicators. And I don't know how many adjudicators they have, but that is still a problem with some people not getting through the adjudicator system. And they've been calling and yeah. calling, doing the same stuff they were doing early, but it's mainly adjudicators. I, it seems like we've got a number of uh, issues that are coming in and it's hard to accept them out. One is the UI debacle, which has spent a lot of time and um, Joint Fiscal Committee has spent a lot of time and we have pushed to add, get more people even to answer the phone. But answering the phone, if you don't know the answer or you don't know how to navigate the system or you don't know the rules, um, it doesn't get you to some resolution. That's right, so that's a lot. That um, I believe has been a topic of discussion by economic development. Then there's the other part, and that is the parameters that have been established for grants for whichever yeah. administering entity. And, um, and so there was a lot of controversy around the decision that the legislature made around sole proprietorships. Yep. Those decisions are gonna be revisited in the proposals that are being advanced by the administration. Yes. And the policy committees will have to consider mm -hmm. them. So I think some of this is going to happen naturally by virtue of either what's in the CRF proposals that the administration is presenting um, to that would uh, address some of these, like the sole proprietorship. Um, Senator McCormick, you have your issue about the two the husband and wife, and that's something I would think you would want to send to yep. economic development. <laughs> and. Um, and, you know, I mean, we've got people in ag that are still yeah. upset that we didn't give the full amount that the governor recommended. So um, uh, there are a whole host of. There is one. Is a bit, what? There is one issue that um, the date was changed from when you had to have been in business from, I think it was um, Jan, I don't know if it was January 1st or uh, there was a date in which you had to be in business in in order to qualify for some of the programs, you know, a business. And then they changed that back to July of 19. And it had been a date in, um, I, think it was February that, I don't know if we had that in or what, of when you had to be in business by. And it said it actually on the application. And then they changed the date and said, oh, no, this isn't any good. You have to have been in business by uh, July of 19. 
And so I have a couple of very good restaurants that um, were in the door at the, right at the right time, got all their accounting stuff in. And then they were told, well, the date changed and you, you didn't own the business. And the person owned a percentage of it prior to that. Then they bought the whole thing on January 7th from the, from the owner for whom they had worked for like 30 years and had been groomed when the guy retired and they didn't get a dime. And, well, and they, the so, only thing I can say is all of this information is coming in very ad hoc. Yeah. I would, every single time it raises a policy <laughs> question whether it came through as it relates to the hazard pay, we can say, yes, we want to address it, or no, uh, we can't make that. Sometimes people want something so refined, the administrative complexity is more yeah. than can be managed. But it was I, would, I would ask all of us that have either around the hazard pay being a problem, which I've been collecting and we're gonna be doing yeah. some changes, or any of the grants that you take the questions that have come to your attention and send it to the chair of the policy committee so that they can, when they're doing their work, they can then say, get testimony as to, can it be changed? What are the reasons it's why it is? Or gee, we didn't <clears throat> realize why it has to be the way it is. But I would, I think that with so much information coming in, um, we've got to we've got yeah. to be somewhat disciplined because the appropriations committee is not going to be the place where some of this right. gets addressed. So I, Senator Westman's got his hand up, Senator McCormick, and then Senator Starr. So I brought up yesterday the idea of there must be somebody doing a tracking document for money going out, and yes, we I have think all Frank of fiscal was going to ask for that. That's, um, I think if they ask for that, then if they're, if we see a place where money's not going out the door, it, I think it highlights a problem. Except right now, if you read a number of these reports, there some of the money has not gone out today, but it's scheduled to go out within a week. Right. So, so uh, you know, I think we've got to be careful how we ask for the data because some yep. of it is just the administrative upfront work and processing that is inherent before an actual expenditure. So no, I, um, I, 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 for an example, the rental assistance, is the money going out the door or is it not? All right, well, we'll see what we can get in terms of uh, updates. Um, and, uh, but that's something joint fiscal can work with Brad Furlan, I think, um, uh, on the fifth floor. Uh, Senator McCormick, you had a comment, and then Senator Starr. I, I just have other members of the committee heard from Chambers of Commerce. Yes. That they're looking oh, for yes. Money. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we got, I think we've got to take a look at that, right? Well, that's, uh, yes, that's on look. the list. And the other, I talked to Betsy Bishop, we put in money for marketing. None of that has gone out yet, and I said to Betsy, has there been discussion about using your regional chambers as uh, you know as partners in that marketing initiative? And she was, I had had no discussion, but was going to talk to ACCD. So it seems like with fall right. foliage coming, yeah. that there have been a number of regional chambers who understand their area of the state. Um, oftentimes, it abuts another state, and how they could work. Um, you know, in, in partnership with and move some of the money out uh, to the to those regional entities. So um, there's been a request. We're hurting. We didn't qualify for some of the other financing, and so a letter has gone out um, requesting um, some kind of uh, financial aid. So yes, that that's on the list, Dick. Thanks, um, Senator Starr. Yeah, uh, we're gonna. The Ag Committee is gonna take up a little bit um, uh, or take testimony in regards to the non-dairy uh, portion of the grant money we sent out. Uh, there's uh, one clause in there that, that if you cannot show a profit between March, April, and May, um, and, and if you do show a profit in that, area or that time uh, zone, then you don't qualify. And then the other 
is that uh, some of the the end dates are like September 1st and and they haven't even got the money out to to deal with it yet only gave them a, like a week or two window to apply and qualify so we're going to look at that next week in ag and then we'll report. Well, you know, I guess they should come and you are identified the problem. They should come back with how they're, do they have a remedy for it? Yeah. And does it take legislative action? In other words, are these administrative um, parameters that they've established or are they um, limitations that we have put um, somehow in, in the budget or in another bill? I think to some extent, I ran into this question with adult days it's the administering departments are putting in these earlier deadlines, but the one that we have used constantly is that December 20th date, that if the money hasn't been spent, then it's being clawed back and we will, um, use, uh, it. We will use it. But, um, but in order to know what can be reallocated because the program has been shut down, et cetera, we, the earlier we know that, the better. But yep. um, if it, if what they're setting is uh, deadlines that are so early, it doesn't give an opportunity, then I think we can, they, yeah. they, they, there's some um, negotiating room there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're we're going to take a look at a few of those problems uh, Tuesday, or well, probably Wednesday. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, I would think, if you know what the issues are and you've told the secretary what they ought to have is a proposal in terms of how they they feel that they can either address it or they feel <laughs> why it's problematic to address it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other comments? Otherwise, um, yeah, I'm going to suggest we um, uh, call it a day for the committee. We're tomorrow. Is tomorrow Friday already? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Friday the 20. I think first. Friday 20? the 21st. Huh. Today's the 20th. Today's the big women's suffrage day. Yes. <laughs> I know. Um, I so the 21st, we're meeting at 1 30, and um, uh, we've got Dale and we have uh, DCF coming in tomorrow afternoon. Um, so Unless there's further discussion or requests that people want to make, I'm going to suggest that we adjourn the meeting for today.